Live from downtown Vancouver at the Vancouver Film School campus, it's time for EP Live. Hello, my friends. Welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas, and we bring you the latest in everything cool. We've got a pack show. I want to get right to it. Uh, this uh, rundown, which we're going to start off with today, is uh, dedicated to Justin A., who says, so lucky to have Victor Lucas review these classics. I think he's talking about the 16-bit superhero games. Man, I have a lot of fun with those. Thank you, Justin A. This rundown is all yours, and let's get started. One of gaming's biggest franchises is finally resurfacing. After years of rumors, 2K has officially announced that the all-new Bi Bioshock game is in development. They haven't revealed a title or any footage, but their press release says that the new game will maintain the franchise's emphasis on powerful narrative and iconic first-person shooter gameplay. We also know that it's the first big project being made at Cloud Chamber, a new development studio 2K has set up in Montreal. Global studio head uh, Kelly Gilmore says they've set up Cloud Chamber to create yet-to-be-discovered worlds, so it's unclear if that means the new Bioshock game will return to the underwater city of Rapture or take players to a whole new location. 2K promises that it will be in development for the next several years, so don't hold your breath. And we've actually got a nice little interview with Kelly Gilmore coming up right after this. But uh, it is going to be a while before we go back into the world of Bioshock. But, uh, you know, I think Straw Zel Zelnick on a, uh, uh, an earnings call talked about Bioshock being one of the cornerstone franchises for 2K. They're not moving away from this franchise, even though famously Ken Levine said, I, I want to get off of this merry-go-round. And he wanted to kind of uh, turn his laser focus focus onto a new project, which we don't know anything about, um, it, Bioshock is going to continue. And this is a big, big deal. I think it's amazing that they've got a, a studio in Montreal that's going to be working on this creative. I think Montreal Studios, there's such a, a wealth of uh, talent and history making narrative-driven video games out there. That's a great, great decision on the part of 2K, and it's exciting. This is the first time that they've got a, a female-led uh, um, studio head, which is fantastic. Uh, or a female uh, studio, or a, a studio led by a female, which is fantastic, and it's their first Canadian studio. So, uh, kudos to 2K, and we'll talk to Kelly all about that stuff in a little bit. Now, Warner Brothers and DC are going to say the magic word and bring back one of their superheroes. Over the weekend at the Sao Paulo Comic Con, the studio officially announced that a sequel to Shazam is on the way. The film's cast and crew had already stated that they hoped to make a sequel, but this is the first public confirmation from the studio itself. Star Zachary Levi is set to return along with co-writer and director David F. Sandberg. As for villains, Dwayne The Rock Johnson has long been attached to a film adaptation of Shazam's arch enemy, Black Adam, which is expected to begin filming next year, so don't be surprised if he appears in the Shazam sequel as well. And of course, I think the big, um, you, you know, uh, sort of question mark right now is whether some of the other DC superheroes are going to make cameos in here and whether this kind of new cinematic Justice League is going to start to emerge alongside Shazam. Um, clearly we have, if you've seen the first Shazam, there's a little bit of a spoiler here, but it's not just the main Shazam character. There's a lot of other superheroes already in the mix here, the whole family, um, which is going to be pretty phenomenal to see everybody in action. But of course, we also got a nice allusion to the fact that Superman exists in Shazam's world at the end of the uh, first movie, which is a lot of fun. I really enjoyed watching it again. I watched it with my, uh, uh, with my kid and her friend, and we all had a really good time diving back into that world again. It's very, even though it's um, violent, a little bit in the uh, vein of the old Gremlins movies, which got kind of horrific in sequences. <laughs> it's surprisingly like, oh my God, they're, they're, they're killing things and they're slicing and dicing and then they go back to being super cute. Uh, Shazam is a little bit like that, uh, which is fine. And I, I, I quite enjoyed it and my kid really enjoyed it as well. I'm looking forward to this. I think Zach Levi was perfect casting, but I want to know and Cavill is in the news right now. He's all over the place. He's doing his Witcher, um, uh, you know, press uh, sit-downs everywhere, talking about how much he wants to be Superman and loves Superman. So I'm curious if Warner Brothers is working with him on messaging there because we're being uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, made to feel comfortable with the idea of Superman returning and uh, squaring up against probably Black Adam first and then Shazam in the sequel here. But uh, certainly... DC and Warner Brothers have a lot of noise to make with 
their movie franchises and their superhero franchises. They just knocked it out of the park with the Wonder Woman 1984 trailer, which is absolutely sensational. Um, that was my era, man. That's they're playing New Order in the in the uh, as the musical backbone of that uh, trailer, and it's fantastic. I love it. Love the aesthetics. I love uh, how they uh, allude to Steve Trevor being back. I loved Chris Pine in the first film. I'm very excited for this next, uh, you know, you know, sort of bevy of uh, of DC movies, and I hope that all of them are rock solid. Still have some concerns about Birds of Prey, but uh, we'll see, man. We might be uh, all thumbs up on a lot of these things, which would be great. Now, next gen is right around the corner, but two of the best games from the last console generation are finally hitting this one. Two hits from Platinum Games, 2009's Bayonetta and 2010's Vanquish, are coming to the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One for the first time in a new bundle called the Bayonetta and Vanquish 10th Anniversary Bundle. Both games have been re remastered up to 4K and 60 frames per second. Oh my God, I gotta see this. Uh, for the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X, although publisher Sega hasn't said if there will be any extra content in the games themselves, the bundle lands in February, and that's kind of like a birthday present to me. Of course, we just visited Platinum. We're gonna have a, a really cool interview with the uh, uh, two of the main people from Platinum on EP very soon. Stay tuned for that. Um, but these were two of the games that made me fall in love with the studio. And of course, Switch owners have been able to play Bayonetta 1 for a while now. And if you picked it up when you were supposed to pick it up a while ago, you've been playing it and enjoying it for years because it's one of the best action games ever made. Uh, but this is phenomenal. Vanquish is also one of those underappreciated gems. And uh, these are both going to sing <laughs> at 4K and 60 frames per second. Our eyes won't be able to believe what they're seeing. I can't wait for that. All right, uh, now Minecraft fans on the PlayStation 4 can finally get together with their friends on other consoles. The long overdue Bedrock version of the game has just landed on the PS4, complete with cross-platform multiplayer support, allowing the console to join up with the Xbox One, Switch, PC, and mobile versions of the game. The Bedrock version first came to these platform to those platforms more than two years ago, making Minecraft one of the first big games to usher in the new era of cross-platform support, but Sony has been, long been a holdout against it. So far, they've only allowed cross-play on the PS4 and a handful of titles like Rocket League, Fortnite, and the new Modern Warfare, so Minecraft is joining a very short list, and this is exactly the kind of future we need to see in video games, right? We need to see that everybody getting along, people deciding whatever you know device they want to access this content with, and then being able to play with friends no matter what system that they own. I think it's uh, it's so archaic to think that when you pick up a piece of software, you can only attach it to one piece of hardware. I mean, that just seems so old-fashioned at this stage. And uh, I'm hoping that we get to a point where you know, this is. Uh, I'm going to be reviewing um, uh, Darksiders Genesis, which I've been playing on Stadia. Uh, but this is a perfect kind of, you know, sort of transition point right here, where, it, it, you know, on Stadia, that particular game costs 10 bucks more than it does on Steam. But it should be like if you just buy the game, you can play it wherever you want. You can download it on your Steam account or your Epic Store or whatever, or to a console. We're not quite there yet, but it's things like this that get us in that direction, which I'm excited about. And uh, it's good news for Minecraft fans. They're gonna be able to play with their friends no matter where they are. That's pretty damn rad. All right, the Golden Globes are proving that comic book movies are nothing to joke about. DC's supervillain movie Joker has received four Golden Globe nominations, including Best Drama, Best Actor in a Drama uh, for Joaquin Phoenix, and Best Director for Todd Phillips. Joker did so well that there are only three movies with more nominations. Noah Baumbach's Marriage Story with six, followed by Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and Martin Scorsese's The Irishman with five apiece. Scorsese, incidentally, was attached to produce Joker before bowing out, and the final film borrows heavily from his past works like Taxi Driver and The King of Comedy. Although several comic book adaptations have been nominated for Golden Globes in the past, none have ever won before. Winners will be announced in January, and honestly, I think Joker's got a pretty good shot at uh, taking home some of these things. It, it won like a three-minute standing ovation at, when it premiered at the uh, Cannes Film Festival. Or was, was it Cannes or was it Venice? It, it was Cannes. Okay. So, you know, the critics went crazy for this thing when they got to see it for the first time at that, at that film festival. And it's a lot of those same people voting on uh, these awards because Golden Globes are the sort of the international press community. I think Joker's going to clean up. I mean, it's made a ton of money. It definitely has an artistic sensibility. You know, think, think what you want about the movie and its subject matter and its uh, 
you know, the way that it sort of deals with the subject of uh, mental illness, it was created with a lot of craftsmanship and uh, a, tr a tremendous amount of intelligence and, um, I, you know, emotion as well. And, and certainly Joaquin is incredible in the movie. I mean, even if you hate the movie and hate what they did with the character, you got to give it up for that guy. He did an amazing job in that role. Uh, and I think it also speaks to the fact that superhero movies are not a genre. They are um, a an access point into several different types of genres. And we're going to start to see a lot more, uh, you know, risks and a lot more choice and, and a lot more dynamic ways into this type of material. Just like the, the comic book industry itself has served up stories with these characters for getting close to 100 years at this point. There's a lot of fantastic material to mine there, lots of great influence to, uh, to turn into these new cinematic works, and, and uh, they ain't going away. They're just gonna get more varied and more interesting, and uh, they're gonna start to make even more money, I think is what's gonna happen as well.